darkness of this world Into the shadows of the night Into this loveless place you came Lightened our burdens, eased our pain And made these hearts your home Into the darkness once again Oh come, Lord Jesus, come Come with your love and make us all far from our souls Oh come Lord Jesus come Into the longing of our souls Into the heavy hearts of stone Shine on us now your piercing light Order our lives and souls aright By grace and love unknown Until in you our hearts unite Oh come, Lord Jesus, come Come with your love and make a soul Come with your light to lead us on souls. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, holy child, Emmanuel, hope of the ages, God with us. Visit again this broken place, till all the earth declares your praise and your great mercy owns. Now let your love be born in us, oh come, Lord Jesus, come, come in your glory, take your place, Jesus the name. place. Jesus, the name above all names, we long to see you face to face. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Let us pray. Eternal and everlasting God, you came to our world in Christ, sharing our humanity. You come to us each day through your Holy Spirit, sharing in our every experience. So now we come to you to share together in worship. Open our eyes to your presence. Open our lives to your grace and power. We come to acknowledge your omnipotence, to recognize your goodness and to declare your wonderful works. We come in awe and wonder to bring our worship, ourselves and our world before you. We come to seek your forgiveness, to confess our many faults and to receive your measureless mercy through Jesus Christ. We come seeking your strength, your guidance and your will. We come to read your word and to listen for your voice and to discern your purpose for us. 
we come offering our discipleship, our gifts and talents and abilities, committing all once again to your service and the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. So come afresh, Lord God, as we watch this, as we engage in this worship. Come afresh as we worship you. Renew our commitment and vision. Renew our faith. Renew our love. For we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we sing together that Advent hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, born to set Thy people free from our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in Thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, did desire of every nation, joy of Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the United Church in Rill for our worship on this, the third Sunday in Advent. You are really very welcome, and it's great to be able to, uh, to worship with you today. Whether you're gathering uh, with uh, others in a small group at Tinnerworth Road to watch this in, on Sunday afternoon, whether you're in your own home uh, this evening watching, watching this, or whether uh, you're catching up at some other point during the week. Um, it's really great that you've been able to, to join with us. And my hope and prayer is that as we worship God today, as we've already prayed, we would know his presence through Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. The service uh, that has been put together for today includes an opportunity to share in communion together and so uh, it would be good if you wanted to take up that opportunity to make sure that you've got a little piece of bread or a cracker or something and something to drink, um, a little bit of wine or juice or water um, and then when we come to that part of the service you've got everything that you need to hand. So if you want to pause this video um, I'll still be here when you get back. Well, there's a couple of notices for me to share with you this evening. Obviously, uh, usually at Christmas time, uh, as we head into Christmas, the, the life of the church gets particularly busy as we enjoy carol singing and services, nativity services and the like. Obviously, things are going to be very, very different uh, this year, but uh, we're still going to have opportunity to be able to worship together, to sing some of those wonderful carols and, uh, and to worship Jesus Christ uh, and recognize his presence uh, afresh with us this Christmas time. And you're going to be really welcome to join us. Uh, there's going to be an online carol service next Sunday. So uh, this service next Sunday will be our carol service um, and uh, you'll be able to uh, 
get the details of that through our YouTube channel. Also this week there should be a little uh, video put together of our Christmas trees and nativity sets. People have been sending me their photographs and I'm going to put that all together so that we can share in some fellowship together. So watch out for that. And then as we head towards Christmas, uh, there'll be a service online, which will be an all-age nativity. I'm hoping that there'll be an opportunity, maybe, for us to have a communion service on Christmas Eve that you'll be able to watch at midnight if you so wish, but perhaps just before you go to bed on Christmas Eve, whenever that might be. And then a Christmas Day uh, service as well. Details of all of that will come out in the mailing and also on email, so do watch out for all of that. But now we turn to God's word and uh, want to hear his voice in our worship today. We've been journeying through Advent, thinking of some of the simple messages that come because Christ has come into the world. So we've thought about a, a simple message of hope as we've looked on that passage from Isaiah Last week, we considered something of Mary's story and how that encouraged us to have a, have a simple but profound faith in God. Today, we're going to think about some of the, the, the burdens and the challenges of our faith. And actually, I'm going to put it to you that the, the Bible shares with us that our burdens should be simple and should be easy to carry. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to look at that um, using Joseph's story, but we're going to hear another passage from Scripture first, from, from Matthew's Gospel, that, that shares my reasoning for, for telling you that um, the burdens that we carry should be easy. But before we do, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, we read in Psalm 25, Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. Lord God, we ask that as we look at your word today, you would show us your ways, you would teach us your paths, you would guide us in your truth. Lord God, we want to hear from you and we want to hear your voice, because you are God our saviour and we choose tonight to place our hope in you that as we read your word you would indeed share the word of life with us moved by your holy spirit we pray in jesus name amen and so some words from matthew chapter 11 at verse 28, some words of Jesus as he's, uh, he, as he's teaching in one of his uh, sermons, as one of his teaching uh, sessions. It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and and humble in heart for my yoke is easy and my burden is light all who are thirsty in the stream of life that the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep we sing
majesty All who are weak Come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out to deep We sing, come Lord Jesus, come Well, friends, you'd be forgiven for thinking it's a little odd to reflect in Advent on some words of Jesus. I've probably crossed a liturgical line that disrupts the journey through Advent, and I wouldn't be so worried about that, apart from the fact that I've recorded this and it's going to be up for people to see for, well, probably quite a while. We're preparing for the birth of Jesus, and here we are, skipping around 32 years forward from a pregnant Mary travelling with Joseph to Bethlehem, and we've skipped forward to a passage in the middle of Matthew's Gospel and some words Jesus spoke on one of his preaching, teaching, miracle-working tours. But what, what wonderful words they are. Words of invitation, words, words that should really encourage us. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And verse 30, for my yoke is easy, says Jesus, and my burden is light. I find a little relief that Handel chose to include these words in his Messiah, or at least a third-person version of them in the chorus, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Music that dances around with the high voices, depicting just how light that burden is. It seems a fairly simple message, a simple invitation. Come, if you are wearied and burdened, Jesus can and will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. The yoke being that wooden bar that a working animal would wear across their shoulders. And at the time people spoke of the yoke of the Jewish law. All all that was required of them took a heavy toll. It chafed at their lives, burdened them with costly requirements to satisfy the demands of the God of the covenant. And Jesus says, no, take my yoke upon you instead and learn from me because I'm gentle and I'm humble in hearts and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. What I ask of you is easy to carry and my burden is light. Wonderful words. A wonderful promise. And somehow, and somehow, if I'm really honest with you, I've, I've often struggled with this idea. Even the simple meaning that Jesus' demands are light and easy. And there are two or three really real queries that I have about these words. 
The first comes from what else we read in Scripture, in other places, in the Gospel accounts. Because Jesus, Jesus says elsewhere, in, uh, in Matthew, Matthew 10, just a few verses before our reading, in Matthew chapter 10, Verse 37, he says, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now, taking up a cross, let alone the things that it just mentioned there about family, taking up a cross doesn't seem like a light burden or an easy yoke. In fact, that sounds like an immense challenge of faith and endurance and perseverance. And I, for one, rejoice and praise the Lord that Christ was able to accomplish all of that. But I know that he is able to do what I cannot And then there's, my, then there's my own experience of these things. I've journeyed with Christ for a fair few years now, not as many as some of you, but still I felt God's call upon my life and the challenge to responding to what God asks of me to be a URC minister, to go to that strange place called Rill, to speak and preach and pray and care and teach and lead and love and share. And all of these things I've been I've been challenged in. And describing those things, I can think of several words. I can think of the immense privilege that it is to be involved in all of that. I can talk about the delight that there is in in serving in that kind of way. I can talk of how exciting that is to see people grow in their faith and the church reach out in new ways. I, I, I can talk of it being encouraging and a wonderful blessing to be part of our fellowship as we, as we journey forward. But two words that I would, I would struggle to use would be to suggest that it's easy to do what God has asked of me and it's light. Light. And I wonder whether you feel similarly. Do you find the things that God asks of you easy and light? Like talking to your neighbours about Jesus? Easy? Like holding broken, hurting people in prayer before God day after day after day? Like loving people who are, who are really difficult and challenging to love? Like reading your Bible every day, praying each day, trusting God when everything around you says don't. How can we sing Isaac Watts' hymn with a whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Did he get it wrong? Have we got it wrong? What is this easy yoke and light burden that Jesus is talking of? Why does it feel so different as we try to respond to God's call and his desire for our lives? And actually, quite apart from what God asks of us, how many, how many burdens and worries and anxieties and stresses and strains and heartaches and headaches do we carry because of others? How many burdens are placed upon us because, because we choose to love and care? And because others, whether consciously or unthinkingly, take advantage of us? No, actually, Jesus, when I look around and I look at my own life and the lives of the folk in our fellowship, holding on to faith in these days and wanting to serve you, the lives of those who are broken by carrying real and heavy burdens for both short and long periods of time, no, Jesus, I'm struggling to see what you mean by an easy yoke and a light burden. And just after I wrote those words, I heard the voice of God 
Come to me in Jesus Christ. He says, I understand. Listen to this. Hear these words now. See, see this example from Matthew chapter 1. Starting at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a faithful man, faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Well, friends, I'm not going to suggest that somehow Joseph's position was as difficult or any more difficult than Mary's whom we thought of last week in our service. To do that would be like suggesting that I had a tough time on the day when our daughter Rachel was born. I mean it was a tough drive to Glancluid Hospital. But Joseph did have plenty though to feel burdened and weighed down by. I'm not sure that at the start of our passage, Joseph felt as if the yoke he carried was easy or his burden light. In fact, his life must have seemed very complex and burdensome. The girl he had been pledged to be married to had told him she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. It's speculation to suggest how Joseph reacted, not just to that news and what he thought of it, but everyone else who heard about it. But the burden of complexity of what he carried is explained in verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. There was the yoke of the law that told him it was crucial he did the right thing. The law said Mary deserved to be stoned. Which of course would be what God wanted. And what anyone he sought for advice would tell him that that is what God would want. Yet you can sense that Joseph, Joseph, Joseph loved this girl. He couldn't do that. He really couldn't. He was, yes, broken, betrayed by this girl. I'm sure perhaps he felt that. That's why he wanted to divorce her quietly. But he couldn't see her stoned, publicly disgraced. And he wouldn't be able to see that through, including the bit where he would have to throw the first stone. So here it is, the complex burden to turn the ba his back on the girl he loved or to turn his back on the God he loved. The human solution he found was, was a, 
was a keeping on the fence and it was a very thin fence. The solution he found was to divorce her quietly. His hopes for their relationship and life together were over and he would shoulder the disgrace potentially for the rest of his life and be burdened and take that difficult yoke and that heavy burden upon himself. In many ways, when the angel appeared and told him to take Mary as his wife after all, well, the burden would, would have seemed even heavier, I imagine. As he chose to stand by her and father a child that was not his and take the flack from his mates, be ostracized by his own family and excommunicated from the worshipping community because of it. And yet, when this passage finishes, it doesn't conclude by saying something like, Joseph woke up and he realized the huge burden that he was going to have to carry as the not father of Jesus or as Mary's husband. There is no talk of him grudgingly accepting what God had called him to do and be. Oh, well, go on, God, then I suppose I've got to. It doesn't even say that Joseph woke up, was thoroughly fed up with God. In fact, if you were to describe how Joseph felt about what God had given him to do, well, the simplicity of what Matthew tells us seems to suggest that it did indeed seem like an easy yoke and a, and a light burden for Joseph to carry. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, verse 24, and took Mary home as his wife but he didn't consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and, and of course he gave him the name Jesus just as the angel told him to because that was dead easy to do. So I'm thinking that the angel, as well as confirming the truth of Mary's story about conceiving by the Holy Spirit, this angel must have shared something, something with Joseph that encouraged him to see that what he had been asked to do was indeed manageable. In fact, not just manageable, but it was an easy yoke to carry and a burden that was light. And I wonder, I wonder what it is about what the angel said that changed Joseph's view. And as we consider that question, I want to ask, is there anything here that really does convince us that Christ gives us an easy yoke and a burden that is light. How can we be inspired by what Joseph saw and heard that day for his life, for our lives? Well, let's hear what the angel said. Verse 20. Joseph had obviously been considering this for quite a while, the idea of divorcing Mary quietly. And that was when an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Uh, we thought last week about how the words do not be afraid by an angel is really angel speak for this is going to be the most terrifying thing that you're probably ever going to experience. But there's no need for you to be afraid. Do not be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So the angel is confirming this kind of statement of truth that Mary is indeed pregnant by the Holy Spirit, as we thought last week. And then a little bit more detail. She will give birth to a son. It's going to be a boy. It's going to be a boy. So, so when you're there and a boy is born, it's going to be a bit of confirmation for you. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save people, save his people from their sins. So, at the time, Jesus was a fairly, a fairly common name in regular usage. Jesus is the Greek version written here of a Hebrew name uh, that we use today as well, uh, Joshua. In terms of popularity, I guess that's a little bit like the angel asking one of us to name a child, I don't know, like um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, name your child Elizabeth. 
But then the angel adds something else. Call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Which, was, which has something of the effect of saying something like today hearing, name your child Elizabeth because your daughter will one day be the queen. You see? And suddenly you're thinking, oh, not just, oh, well, that's a quite a nice name. I quite fancy that name. That's, that's great. But you're thinking, oh, gosh, queen, like Elizabeth, like, like Elizabeth III. Wow. 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 And so Joseph would be going, not, oh, that's a nice name. I always thought that Joshua was a great name. But gosh, really? Save people? Like Joshua. The name Joshua means the Lord saves. And Joseph would, of course, known the story of Joshua in the Old Testament. He was the one who took over from Moses and led the people uh, into the promised land. Through various battles, the people conquered those sinful Canaanites that kept getting in their way and their pagan gods. and, And God's people found their home. I've always found it a particularly difficult bit of Old Testament history, that bit where Joshua leads the people into the promised land and kind of sweeps others out of the way. It always makes me ask a lot of questions, especially since the only justification for doing so is that the people who come into the promised land with Joshua are gods, and he's promised them this land. And those people, those Canaanites, they're not, and they're sinful, and they're barbaric. Have you seen what they do? Joshua He saves. And the focus of the salvation for that original Joshua in the Old Testament was saving God's people from others. The name Joshua, the Lord saves his people from others. And it's a repeating pattern through the Old Testament. After the Canaanites, there were the Philistines who raised army after army against God's people. The people needed saving from those sinful, wayward Philistines that kept just going on about it all the time. And up steps David and he defeats Goliath. The Lord saves God's people from those Philistines. There was the Egyptians, there was the Medes, then the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians. The Old Testament is full of people attacking God's people and God's people looking to God and saying, come on God, you need to save us from those people. Until until the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Persians turn up, those last three that I mentioned, and suddenly hear the theology that God is about saving us from all of those other sinful people starts to break down. It's absolutely shocking if like the Israelites, you bought into it. Because, well, as the Babylonians came and attacked, as the Assyrians attacked, and as the Persians took over from the Assyrians, well, God doesn't save them. He doesn't. God's people are defeated, and they're taken into exile. That's why you have all those soul-searching books like Lamentations, And some of the things that the prophets have said. We thought you were the God who would save us from what everybody else could do to us. Fast forward another couple of centuries. The people are back in Israel. But now it's the Romans who are that invading, threatening people. Everyone was looking for a Messiah, a Joshua, someone who would save them from all those sinful, rotten Romans and their taxes and their ungodly laws and practices and their mighty army parading on the streets of Jerusalem, God's city. So when Joseph hears then that he is to call his son Joshua because he will save his people, well, he's thinking that that his son, this child his wife is carrying, will be saving people from the Romans. Suddenly the burden feels even heavier, the responsibility greater. I mean, if this is God's army's leader of the future, Joseph best makes sure he makes it out of childhood. But Joseph stops. As he reflects on the dream afterwards, he hears the voice, he realizes Actually, that's not quite what the angel said. The angel said something quite different. 
The angel doesn't say that this Jesus will save the people from them sinful Romans, from the sinfulness of others. But that Jesus will save the people from their sins. You hear that? You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. That is shockingly, life-changingly different for Joseph to hear. All the way through the Old Testament, the prevailing thought was that you had to sort yourself out, follow the law's direction, sacrifice here, make an offering there, bring this, keep that Sabbath, do this, that festival, this festival. It was your job to sort yourself out. Take that responsibility seriously. And it was God's job to save you from everyone else. But here, Joseph hears that this is turned completely on its head. Jesus, the child he has been asked to be an earthly father for, will save his people from their own sins. He will sort them out. Now, the question is this. Just how much have we, have you and I, bought into that Old Testament theology? How much do we think that we need to sort ourselves out and it's God's job to sort everyone else out? All those things that we're not in control of. But the stuff that we're in control of, that's down to us to sort out. We so often get caught up in all those things that we tell ourselves. I need to do this. I need to, to, to be that sort of person. If I just do this and this and this, then I'll, I'll, be, I'll be more like that. I need to sort that out and I need to do this. I need to get through this. If I just pull my socks up, if I just persevere for long enough, if I battle hard enough, if I try harder, if I keep going, then I'll be more at peace. I'll be a better person. I'll be the person others will like and I will be a person that God likes. And at the same time, as we think quite a lot of those things, I, I don't know, do, do you recognize that in your own life? I know I recognize some of that in my own life. At the same time as we do that, we buy into all this self-help and self-preservation and self-focused battling stuff. We get more and more confused about this God who doesn't seem to be sorting out anything else around here. This COVID thing's still going on. You know, God, I'm battling hard here to do A, B, C, and D to make myself a better person, and you're not doing anything about that over there. Those people, they're still getting my back up. They were getting my back up last year and they still are now. Rill seems to be declining and the empty shop space is appearing. Have you walked down the streets recently? It's so depressing, God. I thought you were supposed to be sorting that out. Poverty, wars, violence, pain, anguish, all those prayers we offer. Why aren't you sorting all of those things out which become such a burden? And that makes me think, well, I see that now. I see that now, that I've bought into that Old Testament theology. And that makes me think, well, how much, how much of all those difficult yokes we carry and those heavy burdens we carry are because deep down, we still believe that we have to sort ourselves out and God will sort everything else out just how I need it and want it to be. Well, if God, you're not going to sort out my neighbours and my colleagues and my friends and my family, well, that, that'll just have to be the burden that I carry. You hear that phrase, don't you? That'll have to be the burden I carry. And well, if I can't cope with the pain of an illness or losing, losing a loved one, well, that's just, that's just a burden I have to carry. And if you call me to be a minister, an elder, a church member, if you ask me to do this role or that role or be this person, well, God, I'll add it to the list of heavy things on that yoke that you're asking me to carry. Oh, how we bought into all of this. Oh, how I believed all of this, orientated my life this way. And friends, those yokes will just get heavier and heavier and harder and harder until it drags you into the mud 
and those burdens will weigh you down and it won't stop until they tear you apart. Friends, please, please, please hear God's word tonight. Jesus came to save people from themselves, from their sin. God never intended your life to be like this. You don't need to sort yourself out because Christ has come to save you from all of this. Christ has come to minister to you right now in this moment to take those burdens, the burdens that you're carrying right now, to lift them from you. That heavy yoke of expectation that we place on ourselves and just drags us further and further down. You don't need to just get through this or make it to Christmas or the new year or the spring or Easter. You don't need to just try harder or take on more weight and pressure. What you need to do is stop trying to hold it all and cope with it all and do it all and let Christ come. Let Christ come to you this Christmas time to bring his peace, his healing, his love, his delightful, joyous presence that will save you as he lifts those burdens from you Now God really does care about all those other things. And yes, Christ has come to save the world and not just you this Christmas. But his focus is on us as people, individuals, on you. The idea that when Jesus came, he came to earth as a whole is true. And it's handy for Christmas carols because the word earth rhymes with the word birth but he only came to earth as one of us so that he could come to you and I to save us, to carry these burdens and yokes all the way to Calvary if needs be so that you and I can be free to carry on, carry an easy yoke and a light burden. Matthew says, all this took place, verse 22, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel. God with us. With you and I. All who are weary, all who are weak, come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life. Come, Lord Jesus, come. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and he took Mary home as his wife, but he didn't consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Joseph simply went and did as God asked not because it was another burden on top of the other 756 burdens he was already carrying, but because now he knew he was trusting God with 753 of them. And he was walking, living in God's presence with his strength, with simple burdens that he was asked to carry. He took Mary as his wife. He didn't sleep with her until the child was born. And he called him Jesus. And for now, that was all. I hope and I pray that as we share communion in a moment, as we remind ourselves of Christ's sacrifice for us, we and all those who were weary and weak will find burdens lifted, life in all of its fullness, and the joy of salvation. Come, Lord Jesus, come. From the squalor of a borrowed stable, by the Spirit and a virgin's faith, to the anguish 
and the shame of scandal came the savior of the human race but the skies were filled with the praise of heaven shepherds listen as the angels tell of the gift of god come down to us at the servant in the Father's hands, filled with power and the Holy Spirit, filled with mercy for the broken one. Yes, he walked my road and he felt my pain, joys and sorrows that I know so well yet his righteous steps give me hope again i will follow my emmanuel through the kisses of a friend's betrayal he was lifted on a cruel cross he was punished for a world's transgressions he was suffering to save the lost he fights for breath he fights for me loosing sinners from the claims of hell and with a shout our souls are free death defeated by Seeding for his own beloved Till the Father calls to bring them home Then the skies will part As the trumpet sounds Hope of heaven or the fear of hell But the bride will run to And so, friends, we gather here around this table virtually to share in communion together. This is the moment to make sure that you have that little piece of bread or, or something to eat and a little bit of wine or something to drink by your side. And the way we share communion like this is that in, in your own setting, whether at Tinnerworth Road or um, in your own home, uh, you simply copy myself with the, the bread and the wine and I'll, I'll leave some space for you and anybody else who is with you in your bubble to, uh, to share in the bread together and then the wine. 
but it is following Christ's example that as we come to share in bread and wine together, as we remember the sacrifice that he made for us to take our burdens, it's following his example that we take bread and wine and we give thanks to God. Let's pray. Lord God, in this Advent season, we want to give you thanks and praise for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, we recognize something of the struggle that it is to live by faith in today's world. And we thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us one who brings a simple message of hope encourages us to journey simply in faith and offers to take all of the complex, heavy and hard burdens and the yoke that we place around our, ourselves and replace them with a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. Lord God, as we come to share in bread and wine together, we remember Christ's sacrifice for us, that out of a deep, deep love for us, he faithfully, wonderfully, endured the cross, He gave up his life for us. That in his death our sin would be dealt with. The burdens that we place around ourselves would be gone. The yoke that looks to pull us down into the mud and into the mire would be lifted from us and be shattered as Christ's own body was broken. As he took the punishment we deserve for our sin in our place. And so, Lord God, we come now We turn from our sin We lay down those heavy burdens And we ask Lord Jesus that you would take these heavy yokes from around our necks And bring your salvation to us as we place our faith and trust in you once more. Lord Jesus, oh, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We praise you. And Lord God, we thank you for the wonderful assurance that Christ's resurrection has brought to us that confirmation, that absolute declaration to us and to the rest of the world that Christ has won, that death has been defeated, that sin has been conquered, that now the yokes are easy and the burden is light. Lord God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Assure us of your forgiveness Come, Holy Spirit, and move in us. Bring your healing hands, your strengthening hands, your encouraging presence, your loving presence into our hearts and into our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, and transform these gifts of bread and wine that as we eat and drink, so we renew our faith in Christ, so we choose by eating and drinking, to take the yoke that is easy and the burden that is light.
Come, Holy Spirit. Walk with us. Be Emmanuel, God with us right now. And come, Holy Spirit, reign in us until that day when we gather with all of the saints around your throne to praise you, almighty God, one God, the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To you be all glory, all honor, all majesty, and all praise. Thanks be to God. Amen. So friends, we remember that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we eat. Friends, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Lord God, we thank you and praise you for what you have given, what you have offered us, and what you have encouraged us in. Thank you for your presence with us by your Holy Spirit. Let us go to serve and glorify Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is another one of those wonderful Advent hymns. There's a light upon the mountains. the 
spring when our eyes shall see the beauty and the glory of the king weary was our hearts with waiting and the night would seem so long but his triumph day is breaking and we hail it with the song there's a hush of expectation and a quiet in the air and the breath of God is moving in the fervent breath of prayer for the suffering dying Jesus is the Christ upon the throne and the travail of a spirit is the Casting up the way, he is calling for his angels to build up the gates of day. But his angels here are human, not the shining horse above, for the drum beats of his army. We hear a distant music, and it comes with fullness swell. Tis the triumph song of Jesus, of our King Emmanuel. Zion and God are forth to meet Him, and my soul be swift to bring all your finest and your Well, friends, I'm really pleased that you've been able to join with us today, and I hope and pray that you have known God's presence with you as we have worshipped, as we've shared in bread and wine together, and as we have heard God's words to us this evening. Now, let us go with the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May he be with us all, this day and always. Amen.